Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining me today is Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all of the guests to appear on STEM Talk. Hello, Don. Great to be here to introduce our discussion on high-intensity exercise with none other than Dr. Doug McGuff. Yeah, it was definitely an eye-opener hearing from him how brief, infrequent, high-intensity exercise is relatively better for our overall health. This concept is counterintuitive when it comes to the standard gym regimen of walking on a treadmill for 30 minutes and then lifting a bunch of weights for about another hour. Absolutely. You know, Doug's approach is really based on science, hence the clever name of his book, Body by Science. Mm -hmm. In this interview, we also discussed myokines, among other things. Myokines are cytokines secreted by working muscle. Myokines have both local actions within the muscle tissue itself, but also hormone-like effects that target distant organs. Thus, they have an important role in the far-reaching effects and benefits of exercise. Yeah, and I found it interesting to hear about how he transitioned as a BMX competitor to an emergency medicine physician to a health and wellness expert, too. Before we get to today's interview, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews piling up on iTunes. As we announced in several earlier episodes, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing the iTunes reviews, with an eye towards selecting the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. As always, if you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the wonderful nickname, Guy Who Likes Chipotle. The review is entitled, Interesting and Just Complex Enough. Here is the winning review. STEM Talk does an amazing job of delivering high-level information on a variety of topics without making it too complex to understand. Wow, thank you, guy who likes Chipotle. And I love that name, and I love Chipotle, too. And all the other STEM Talk listeners who have helped STEM Talk get off to such a great start. Okay, and now on to today's interview with Doug McGuff. Doug McGuff became interested in exercise at the age of 15 when he first read Arthur Jones's Nautilus Training Bulletin No. 2. His interest in exercise and biology led him into a career in medicine. In 1989, he graduated from the University of Texas Medical School at San Antonio and went on to train in emergency medicine at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences at Little Rock, where he served as chief resident. From there, he served as faculty in the Wright State University Emergency Medicine Residency and was a staff emergency physician at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Hospital. It's really too bad that Doug missed Arthur Jones' Nautilus training bulletin number one. <laughs> I mean, he started with number two. <laughs> the timing. <laughs> Throughout his career, Dr. McGuff maintained his interest in high-intensity exercise. Doug realized a lifetime dream when he opened Ultimate Exercise in November 1997. Over the past 19 years, Dr. McGuff and his instructors have continued to explore the limits of exercise through their personal training of clients at Ultimate Exercise. He has also summarized his training approach in the book Body by Science. In addition to his work at Ultimate Exercise, Doug is an emergency physician for the Greenville Health System and is an assistant clinical professor of emergency medicine at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine in Greenville. STEM Talk. 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 Hi, this is Don Carnegis, and joining us today for STEM Talk is Doug McGuff. Doug, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And also joining us is Dr. Ken Ford, director of IHMC. Ken, welcome. Welcome, Doug, and good to be with you, Don. So, Doug, let's start at the beginning and discuss how you first became interested in resistance training. Can you talk a little bit about Arthur Jones, his Nautilus machines, and his influence on your thinking about resistance training? Yeah, um, how I originally came to resistance training, I was actually a young teenager, maybe 13 or 14 years old, and I was interested in the a brand new sport, BMX or bicycle motocross. Mm. 
and um, it was something I'd just come across in a magazine, organized our own races locally, and I was, it was like most things in my life, as I had a very deep, deep interest in it, but I was really bad at it. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't perform very well. But um, my brother had taken a weightlifting course in college, and there was a old Sears cement, you know, plastic over cement barbell set in my garage. And I had a little manual with it. I thought, well, I'm going to give this a try because I was just getting beat so badly it was almost embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, the races were conducted just once a month. So over the course of a month, I just followed this manual and did some weight training in, in its simplest form. And the very next month, the, the transformation from it was just amazing. It mm -hmm. It is still the closest thing to magic or a miracle that I've ever experienced in my life in terms of the difference that it made, and it really made me competitive in that sport. Um, it's probably a year later I was actually out um, doing a workout, doing some sprints on the bike. I was uh, up at the high school, and running around the track was a middle-aged gentleman, probably in his 50s, very muscular, impressive guy, and I just struck up a conversation with him. Turns out that he had opened a new Nautilus gym in, in my hometown of San Antonio, and it was a very new thing at the time. And he invited me to come over and take a look. And it was, you know, awe-inspiring. The equipment was so cool looking. And I worked out on it and was very impressed. There's no way I could afford to go there. But I bartered janitorial services for a membership. And one weekend, I was doing my, every weekend I'd go in and clean up the place, clean his office. I was cleaning his office out, and there was this big yellow book or pamphlet sitting on his desk and said Nautilus Training Principles Arthur Jones hmm. so I picked it up and I was flipping through it and he walks in the office and says oh he goes you're interested in that you can take it home and they sent me several copies when I bought the equipment took it home first book I ever read cover to cover in one sitting and to say that that changed the course of my life would be just a massive understatement so that's how I came to know of Arthur Jones and have an interest in him. He was the inventor of the Nautilus equipment. Um, he really championed the idea of high intensity strength training and championed the idea way back then that its effects went way beyond just strengthening muscle, that it had effects across the entire health spectrum. Um, and it, it was really groundbreaking and well ahead of its time. Appropriately, we are recording this episode of STEM Talk at IHMC's Ocala, Florida location. Arthur Jones lived right here in Ocala at his rather amazing Jumble Air facility. I understand that we both share the experience of having visited him there. Yes. I was there in the early 1980s. Uh, can you tell us about your visit? Yeah, I was, uh, I was actually in the military at the time. I had an Air Force scholarship for medical school. So after I completed my residency training in emergency medicine, um, I was in the Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. And it was coming to the end of my commitment. I was en route to Orlando for a national meeting to try to find a civilian job. And I had always wanted to meet Arthur, so I called him out of the blue, ended up speaking to Inga, um, who later became his wife, um, and arranged a meeting on the trip down um, where we would spend the day with him. And uh, that was in summer of 94. I don't remember exactly what month, but uh, we came, we met him at Jumbo Lair. Was, you know, he took us on a tour of the MedEx facility. It was an intense experience, to say the least. I mean, we came there. He had a whole um, little entourage of very threatening-looking men that would follow you around. I had a briefcase with me, and they were very upset and interested that I had the briefcase. And he actually had me drive his town car and chauffeur him to Gainesville to give a lecture at one of these uh, MedEx conferences. And he just... Um, you know, um, lectured us ad nauseum in the car back and forth. And um, my, my wife was very enamored with him and he with her. It was, uh, I was sort of superfluous on the trip. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was my lifetime goal to meet this guy. And uh, he was, you know, 
too busy flirting with my wife to even bother with me, but it was still an incredible experience. <laughs> Interesting place. Yeah, it, it was it was an amazing experience. But he he talked to me and my wife and told us things that, um, you know, we saw come to pass that he predicted, and it, it was just it was prescient some of the things that he told us that we would see in our lifetime that we have now seen and. Are any of those just spring to mind and seem appropriate? No. <laughs> yeah, that was my fear. I mean, it's more more on a socioeconomic yeah, um, gotcha. I know exactly. <laughs> but, you know, working in an emergency room, you kind of get a front row yeah. seat for everything that Arthur might predict about the future. Every once in a while, it's like, oh, yeah, that's what he was talking about. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> right there. <laughs> So, Doug, given your background in BMX biking, like you, you talked about BMX racing and um, your interest in resistance training, it seems like you would have gone into something like sports medicine or orthopedics. So what led yeah. you into emergency medicine? Well, you know, when I say that reading the Nautilus training bulletins was life-changing, it really was. And I guess I would have to say why I went the route that I did rather than going into orthopedics, physical medicine and rehab or something of that nature probably really was because of Arthur um, because he gave me enough intellectual understanding of exercise to realize that a lot of what I would be taught in those residencies would be wrong. And to survive it, I would either have to choke it down um, or be changed in a way that I did not want to be changed because I knew from my interactions with Arthur that a lot of the notions of exercise and rehabilitation that were being promulgated by those specialties were in fact wrong. I was fortunate enough in my medical school, school training to have actually done a rotation in emergency medicine. And the reason I went that pathway is because it's rare to find something in life, especially for me. I talked about BMX and being so bad at, but it was rare for me to find something that I felt like I had intrinsic talent in, but I felt like I functioned really well in that environment and that's where I should go. And I rationalized it in my head that in this specialty, I'll be able to tell, take care of people when they fall down and get hurt, but then I can have this other interest where um, I try to keep that from happening in the first place. It kind of had that fantasy in my head. To some extent, that's panned out, but that was the rationale at the time. Mm, that's great. You mentioned BMX a couple times. I uh, understand that you were recently elected to the BMX Hall of Fame. Yeah, it's actually oh, the Texas BMX Hall of Fame, um, and that was just, you know, I was one of the early pioneers in the sport that built one of the first tracks in the area. And then I did very well in the 70s and 80s, and then came back to racing in the late 90s, um, won a state championship during that period of time in the master's class, and then also, because of my involvement in exercise, trained some world champion professional level BMX racer. Um, so all those things kind of got me the nod for that. So it seems well-deserved. Yeah. Uh, Maybe he's too humble. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a geek that they couldn't ignore any longer. Well, congratulations. Well, that's thanks. Great. That's cool. It, it's amazing. I was telling Ken earlier that uh, you know it seems like a silly thing. It's something you do when you're a teenager, but how much meaning it has to you at my at 54 was um, way beyond my expectations. It actually did mean a lot to me. Yeah, absolutely. That's really cool. Um, so you were talking about the tie between emergency medicine and some of the things that you were learning from exercise and, and that your background and uh, resistance training and what you were learning through your reading during that time. So in some quarters, uh, there's this push for treating exercise and nutrition as medicine. Do you think more emphasis should be placed on the concept of exercise is medicine? Absolutely. The problem with that currently um, and, and for someone that's not in medicine, it's hard to understand. But right now, a practicing physician is so busy with the chronically sick and massively debilitated mm -hmm. that it's really the gap, the chasm between day-to-day -day life and actually thinking about the medical applications of something in terms of prevention is such a wide chasm, it's hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. But I really would love 
the day to come when the commercial says, ask your doctor if diet and exercise are right for you <laughs> <laughs> instead of, you know, whatever pill of the day. Right. But it it not only is medicine, it it is the medicine. It never fails. It's what works. Um, and so, yes, very much I would like to see that come to pass. And I would like to feel that before my life's over, I would, might have some tiny contribution to that. Yeah. Um, so you've made the comment about the fact that we are meant to live with a high level of physiologic headroom. Yes. What do you mean by that? Okay, so I didn't come up with this concept. Uh, a guy named Arthur Devaney came up with it. He's actually um, an economist um, and a mathematician that's uh, um, very adept in kind of a chaos theory or a randomness of, of economies. But he was sort of one of the early pioneers of uh, evolutionary health. Um, and he defined physiologic headroom as the difference between the least you can do and the most you can do. Okay. And I first intuitively experienced that concept of physiologic headroom by the change in my performance that occurred over a one month time span when I first started lifting weights. Mm -hmm. And that really drove it home for me. Um, so physiologic headroom is achieved in our evolutionary past just by the way that we had to live. The stimulus of the hard physical work we had to do produced the adaptation of a high physiologic headroom. Mm -hmm. But in our modern times, that is all too easy to achieve if you understand how to apply a stimulus to achieve it. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, that high physiologic headroom, the stimulus response relationship that creates that is intact throughout an, our entire lifespan. So at any point, if you apply the appropriate stimulus, you can get the adaptive response of high physiologic headroom. And that can be maintained over a lifespan. And that produces what I call area under the curve. Mm -hmm. So if you have a high physiologic headroom over a long lifespan, your performance area under that curve is massive. And that's how we really have evolved to live. Um, and instead, our modern life ways have created a circumstance where starting in the late teens, early 20s, there starts to be a decline that is gradual that by the late 20s becomes precipitous. Mm -hmm. So the better part of our lives in terms of our functional ability are much less than what they should be in terms of that area under the curve concept. That's really interesting. So. Do you think that high-intensity interval training is the best choice of exercise for aging populations since evidence suggests that it can augment skeletal muscle as well as confer cardiovascular benefits? Do you think that would probably be the best approach for the aging population? Well, according to the current literature, that answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And the reason, in my point of view, that the answer is yes is because the intensity is high. The stimulus intensity... Um, is high. That is, that kind of activity is going to produce a fairly rapid and deep level of muscular fatigue. Mm -hmm. That is the stimulus that drives the adaptation to be stronger in all the metabolic adaptations. So the literature that's looked into high-intensity interval training has said, yeah, this is what produces those adaptations that actually reverse these biomarkers of aging. But my own personal take on it is my approach, and really, which is an extension of Arthur Jones' approach, which is an extension of Ken Hutchins, which was an employee of Arthur Jones' approach, is to perform that type of high-intensity work, but as a resistance training protocol. Mm -hmm. The difference there being is that with resistance training, you can select a weight that is challenging, that's going to invoke fatigue, which produces a rapid weakening of the muscle, but the idea is that as you weaken and as you fatigue, the forces involved in carrying out that exercise protocol start out small and diminish as you fatigue. Whereas with a high-intensity interval program performed on some sort of aerobic piece, um, you don't have that resistance invoking the fatigue, and you're actually using very rapid and ballistic movements mm -hmm. to achieve the intensity. 
Well, those rapid and ballistic movements involve acceleration forces, and force is mass times acceleration. So for an elderly person that's trying to regain their physiologic headroom, that protocol can actually expose them to some danger in terms of injury that, in my opinion, isn't necessary if you use a better protocol like what I advocate. It gets all the benefits of high-intensity interval training, Mm -hmm. but has all the benefits of resistance training and the strengthening that come along with it kind of wrapped into one package. And it actually, the harder it gets, the safer it becomes. And it's a really neat um, way of getting around the intensity force problem. So let's talk about your book, Body by Science, and you elaborate on this training protocol called the Super Slow, um, which involves lifting and lowering the weights very slowly. Can you describe the origins of this technique and enumerate why you see this as an advantage as far as training protocol goes? Yeah, and and to be clear, anything that I've written about in that book, along with my co-author, John Little, was not anything that we invented or came up with. So... Um, The concept of super slow training actually germinated out of Nautilus in the early 1980s, 1981-1983 time frame, when Arthur Jones commissioned an osteoporosis research project that was being conducted at the University of Florida Gainesville. Mm -hmm. And two of his employees, husband and wife, Brenda and Ken Hutchins, were tasked with running the research protocol. The tricky thing was is these were women with fairly advanced osteoporosis, so they're going to be very injury prone. Mm-hmm. So they decided to create a training protocol to offer extra protection of these women, and they did it by moving slower than their normal protocol. So they selected approximately a 10-second lifting time frame, approximately 5 seconds on the lowering phase, the idea behind was behind it was to diminish the acceleration forces as much as possible. So to expose them to a strengthening protocol that limited force as much as possible. And what ended up happening is they ended up seeing a rate of strength progression in these subjects, which was greater than what they'd seen in the past. So the assumption was, well, maybe it's just because these are elderly female and they're catching up you know, with a vengeance. Um, But when they applied the protocol to younger, more athletic populations, they saw a similar improvement in rate of results. Um, And that resulted in Ken kind of really going down the rabbit hole and protocolizing the whole super slow thing. Now, we advocate that, John Little and I advocated that strongly in Body by Science. And um, Ken Hutchins had his whole super slow exercise guild that then um, kind of transformed into a company called Renaissance Exercise that again made more equipment. Um, but along the way, what, what's been found is it's not so much that there's anything magical about lifting over a 10 second time frame. More important is the style and intent. And what we have found is that if your intention is not just to make the heaviest weight go up and down for as long as possible. But if your intent is instead to as effectively and deeply fatigue the musculature as you can, what we found is that if you initiate the start of a set of weightlifting with as gradual of an upload of force as possible, and then you just try to lift and lower with high effort, during that initial phase, depriving yourself of initiating any momentum really allows the speed to express itself organically. And that can vary depending upon equipment. It can vary depending upon the individual and their own neurological efficiency. So in one person, the cadence may express itself as eight seconds up, eight seconds down. Another person might be 13 and 13. Another person may be as fast as four, four. Mm -hmm. But the more important idea is to have a gradual upload and then have the intent of fatiguing the muscle as deeply and quickly as possible, and letting the speed of movement express itself organically. But when you do that, on average, you'll find over a population, it's about a 10-second cadence is what ends up expressing itself. 
but it, from individual to individual, it may vary. And it may vary in an individual at different times uh, over, over a lifetime. So. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. In keeping with our earlier discussion regarding the osteoporotic women, uh, my very first goal in the gym is to not injure myself. It would seem that super slow is a very safe resistance training modality for almost anyone, including quite senior trainees. Um, You've worked with a lot of people with super slow. What what has your experience been in this regard? Um, Well, I opened my own personal training center in 1997. It's ultimate exercise. And currently we're doing 100 to 120 workouts a week. And we've done workouts since 19. We've never injured anyone in the facility, um, which is a good track record. And that gives some credit to, you know, a slow cadence protocol, but also, I mean, you can still get hurt doing a slow cadence protocol if you don't observe good biomechanics. Um, And if you go outside appropriate muscle and joint function, you put yourself in vulnerable joint positions, you can still get hurt no matter how cautious you are. Um, And the mastermind in that realm, in my opinion, is a fellow named Bill Day Simone. If your listeners ever want to just hit Google and put in his name or the term moment arm exercise or congruent exercise, um, there's a little treasure trove of YouTube videos that are very good about no matter what cadence you select to train at, about how to use biomechanics in a way where you're not going to hurt yourself. But I agree with your point, and you don't really appreciate that point unless you ever have injured yourself in the gym. And then all of a sudden you realize that 18-inch arms don't mean jack if you have a herniated lumbar disc (laughs) and can't move, Um, and that nothing drives it home like actually having hurt yourself and then gone, what was I thinking? You know, I just... This is just wrong on so many levels. You know, just that that is the first imperative is just don't injure yourself. Yeah, and you see a lot of people do injure themselves. Yeah, and that's my, you know, my clients, I give a lot of latitude for developing their own style of training clients, and I tell them, you know, train them hard as hell, don't injure anyone, give them adequate recovery. It, that's it. Yeah, it's good. You know? It's good stuff. You know, as the baby boomers, of which I am one, uh, continue to mature. Mature is a nice word. But, uh, they, they hope to continue to age, but as they yeah. continue to mature, there is growing interest in fending off sarcopenia, the, you know, the typically described as the age-related loss of lean muscle mass strength and, most importantly, functionality. And it's well established that age-related reductions in muscle mass are mainly attributed to the atrophy of our fast twitch muscle fibers. So it would seem that reversing or preventing fast twitch muscle fiber atrophy should be considered really a primary target for any any effective intervention and attempt to reverse uh, this loss of muscle uh, strength, size, and function. Can you talk a little bit about your super slow protocol in the context of preventing and reversing sarcopenia. Sure. Um, I guess the first thing to mention about it before even embarking upon training protocol is when we talk about sarcopenia, the population has it in their head that this is a natural consequence of aging, Mm -hmm. and it's not. Um, sarcopenia is a natural consequence of aging with our modern Western lifestyle injected into the equation. Um, if you look at hunter-gatherers, that age-related muscle loss does not happen uh, in um, hunter-gatherer societies where high-effort physical activity is preserved across a lifespan. So it's not a natural state that we're combating with artificial protocol. Um, Having said that, 
that doesn't mean that modern technology cannot be exploited to leverage um, those evolutionary adaptations. And I think that's where um, the kind of training protocol that that we talk about in Body by Science and elsewhere comes into play is, is you're correct. When we talk about age-related sarcopenia, where that atrophy really happens is in these type 2 muscle fibers. And for the audience that is not as geeked out on this stuff as we all are, um, you basically, when you recruit muscle to do work, that happens in an orderly and sequential fashion. You start with lower order muscle groups that are made up of smaller packets of muscle fibers that um, produce low levels of force but have higher levels of endurance. And then next you recruit groups of muscle fibers in tandem that produce a little bit more force but are a little bit less enduring. And then finally, when the effort's really high, you recruit recruit these higher order motor units, these type 2 and 2B fibers that you discuss. Um, And they produce a lot of force output, but they fatigue very quickly and their recovery characteristics are a little bit more fragile. So by definition, unless you're carrying out fairly intense physical activity, they're hard to get at. Um, But when you do get at them, you can get at them one of two ways. You can get at them by doing something that is a very sudden, forceful, high output of effort, like trying to deadlift 300 pounds or trying to throw a very heavy stone a far distance or shot put or whatever. And what you're doing there is you're taking those three different gross muscle fiber types and bringing them into play all simultaneously. The problem with that is you're generating very high forces that may exceed um, the structural limits of tendons and bone and other elements that could produce injury. The other way to get at those higher order motor units is to produce fatigue in a more disciplined and gradual fashion where you fatigue out these lower motor lower order lower order motor units sequentially and then get to these higher order motor units recruit them and then fatigue them so that you're doing it in such a way that you're actually getting at those because these other motor units have dropped out and you're getting weaker so the force is actually controlled and diminished by the time you get to these motor units but the idea is you want to stimulate those and keep those awake An elderly person doesn't lose balance because they're stiff and arthritic. They lose balance because if you go off the vertical plane where you're not standing on a bone-in-bone tower anymore, the only way you can right yourself when you're leaning that lever forward out of the axis of gravity is by activating very powerful muscles to correct that, um, that posture deficit that is very leveraged. Um, And that requires these higher order motor units. So elderly people fall because when they get off that vertical axis, they don't have those fast twitch 2B fibers to like yank them back into corrective posture. And that's why they go down like, you know, like a tree in the forest. Our robot has that problem too. Yeah, you need some 2B fibers for that thing. (laughs) 2B. (laughs) <laughs> for Atlas. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, Doug, you've advocated that for most people it makes sense to aim for a minimum effective dose of exercise. What do you mean by that? Well, first, we have to define what we mean by exercise. And by exercise, I mean what I mean by exercise. And that is this type of protocolized strength training that is very disciplined and aimed towards being very intense and achieving a deep level of fatigue rapidly. That, by necessity, because it's so hard, has to be abbreviated because you can't stand more than 12, 15 minutes of that kind of intensity. And the recovery from that takes time. It simply takes your body time to synthesize the adaptive changes to make more tissue and all the metabolic substrate that supports it. So in that 
realm when I talk about dosing exercise, you do want the minimal effective dose. You want the amount that's going to trigger the adaptation and no more because then you're starting to dig into and interfere with that recovery process, Mm -hmm. which is really what generates the adaptation. Most people think of exercise as directly causing the adaptation. The ab roller will firm and tighten your abs. No, the exercise produces a stimulus, which is this deep level of fatigue. Your body receives that stimulus and then makes a physiologic adaptation. So in that realm, yes, I advocate the minimal effective dose. Where that becomes controversial with people is they conflate exercise to mean not just that, but going for a walk or playing tennis or taking a jiu-jitsu class or fill in the blank. So I make a very clean distinction between exercise, which is what I say it is, and activity. And activity, while a lot of people categorize that as exercise, it's not what I mean by exercise. As a matter of fact, what we find in our clients over time, because I used to really advocate between workouts, just rest and do nothing but rest, because I was trying to augment that recovery situation, what we found universally was that failed miserably. Our clients went crazy. They were so active. Something about waking up their musculature also woke up this active genotype. They became incredibly active. They took up sports. They took up sports that they abandoned when they were in their youth and um, became very, very active. And that seems to be the case across the board, is that once you create this physiologic headroom, you want to use it. It's like having a Ferrari and being restricted to a school zone. It just doesn't work. You don't want to sit at a desk anymore. (laughs) Those activity (laughs) levels really do go up. And now I start to realize that that's not a bad thing. That does not interfere with recovery. That is actually a physiologic and biologic expression of, yes, you have achieved the goal of triggering this, you know, um, adequate physiologic headroom. Hmm. Well, a super slow uh, protocol is one set to failure. And failure is such an interesting and perhaps unfortunate uh, word there. But uh, in the context of super slow, could you explain your definition of what exercising to muscle failure is and what it implies? Well, you're correct. And Arthur um, Jones really coined the term muscular failure. Um, But the problem is, is that concept got conflated um, with people's experiences in the gym. And in grossest terms, muscular failure means that you're lifting and lowering the weight and you get to a point where for some reason, the force that you can generate with the muscles can no longer overcome the force of the weight, and movement stops. You're trying as hard as you can to move the weight, but the weight won't go, and that's muscular failure, or that is failure. The problem with that is failure in and of itself um, does not um, necessarily define the adequate stimulus. The stimulus is actually generating a in a short period of time, a meaningful depth of fatigue or a reduction in your starting level of strength. So if you pin a heavy weight on a bench press movement, you may reach muscular failure on the third or fourth repetition because when your shoulder and your elbow joint reach 90 degrees, the force output through that moment arm is so minimal that you can't get over that sticking point and you fail, you've reached failure. But the problem is, is by that point in the set, you've not really generated much depth of fatigue or much reduction in your starting level of strength. In that case, you're better to potentially do multiple sets to stop short of failure and then do another and stop short of failure and do another, or perhaps have a drop set where you reduce the weight and then do some more reps, reduce the rate, do some more reps, and then finally reach failure after having reached an adequate depth of fatigue, say a 40% reduction in your starting level of strength. Mm -hmm. Um, That is sort of a workaround. Whereas when you have more idealized equipment, stuff like what Arthur Jones invented that's 
low friction that has a strength curve that matches your force output through a range of motion. In that context, one set of training is more than adequate because you reach this depth of fatigue that's maybe even way beyond what's necessary within 90 seconds. Mm -hmm. You're there and you're done. Um, but having said that, a lot of people say, oh, this single set is not enough. But you got to look at it in context of how much of that time is spent under meaningful load producing meaningful fatigue. So if you go into Gold's Gym and you take a stopwatch and you watch your average bro train down there and he goes to the dumbbell rack, picks up a set of dumbbells and does some flies, you click start when he starts his movement. When he's done with that movement, you click stop. And then he's going to walk around. He's going to look at some chicks. He's going to mess around and get his favorite song on his iPhone. Mm -hmm. And then he'll go do another set. At that moment, press start. And then when he finishes his set, press stop. And then you get his accumulated time under meaningful load for the entire workout. And you tally that all up. And in most cases, that will be less meaningful time under load than what my clients get in a workout that lasted 15 minutes. Mm. The thing is, you're just exploiting the technology to get meaningful time under load, to get after what really is the stimulus, which is this deep level of fatigue. The super slow protocol, as described in your book, is performed exclusively on machines, and um, folks often wonder how this transfers to what is sometimes called real-world functional movements and basic movement patterns, such as squats, hinge, push-pull, carry, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, you know, would you chat about that a little? Yeah, I th it, it's difficult for me to respond to those kind of questions because when people talk about functional movement and movement patterns, um, I find that they're fairly ill-defined. So in the absence of a specific definition of what they're talking about, it's hard to answer to it. But I think that human movement in terms of a functional sense in these natural movement planes that you described um, are inherent to our physiology and our anatomy. What is necessary for those to express themselves in, and I'm going to put this in air quotes for people listening, real-world applications is that you have to have a motor that's able to drive the movements of that appendage. Mm -hmm. And that's where I answer that the type of strengthening that we're going after through this protocol creates the functional strength that expresses itself through the mechanism of our anatomy and physiology. So the notion that you have to recreate those functional movement patterns in the gym under load for those functional movement patterns to be expressed out of the gym, I think is a little bit of a false construct. Um, some of those natural movement patterns when done under load um, are very joint incongruent. You may be out of scapulohumeral timing at your shoulder joint and under load, you're going to be begging for a rotator cuff tear or a slap injury, and once you've done that, all functionality goes out the window. Rather, I would rather load the musculature under safe muscle and joint planes, get that deep level of fatigue that's going to serve as a stimulus to make for a strengthening adaptation, and then with that strength, when you go out and do whatever real-world functional movements you're doing, um, you're going to be better able to do those. And some of what's done in the gym to me just strikes me as begging for injuries. I mean, and not really functional per se. A lot of the Olympic lifts. Oh, yeah, for reps. For reps. I mean, Olympic lifting is a sport. It was meant to be done in a completely fresh state to demonstrate a complex skill at maximal output. Do that as a fatiguing protocol. In a joint incongruent position, as you get fatigued and sloppy, you're begging to get injured. I mean... Seals in the wild are very functional animals. Now, you can take a seal, put it in the circus, and teach it how to balance a ball on its nose, 
but that doesn't make it a better seal than the one that lives in the lot in the wild and has no idea how to balance a ball on its nose. So, uh, uh, confusing uh, sport and exercise uh, yes. is a dangerous uh, a dangerous confusion. Correct. That's a really good point. So we talked about resistance training as being key to the maintenance of type two muscle fibers. So what about things like long, low intensity jogging, kind of long, slow jogging, or something like watching TV on the elliptical machine at the gym. Uh, this would seem counterproductive for older folks who are interested in maintaining fast twitch muscle. What do you think about that? Yeah, in the context of if you're telling an old person you need to exercise in order to get at these fast twitch muscle fibers. And then the problem is the people that make these recommendations for the elderly to exercise then turn around and act as if they're made of porcelain and tell them to go, you know, stand in a swimming pool and do this little protocol or, you know, just stay on the elliptical because it's low force. They don't understand how to invoke high intensity and low force at the same time to get at them. That's the problem. Um, and it's not to say that those kind of activities don't have value. They do. Um, you know, just being physically active at a low level of intensity is part of our evolutionary biological background. And if that has to be invoked artificially, then so be it. But what I found is if you get at those 2B type fibers like we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. that kind of background activity level at a low level expresses itself organically and automatically. The problem with doing that as an exercise protocol with the attempt, intent of producing an adaptation to get at these higher order motor units is that it doesn't work. And not only that, it doesn't work with a vengeance. Because what you're doing is you're carrying out a type of long-term low intensity activity that says the adaptation then becomes this animal is carrying out chronic low level activity. Right. So the marginal utility of carrying around any extra muscle mass in terms of type T 2B fibers becomes interpreted as a negative thing. Mm -hmm. You're carrying around extra baggage for no reason. That can actually serve as a stimulus to lose type 2B muscle fibers rather than to gain them. You see that in marathoners, Yes, for that's why marathon and ultra endurance athletes look cachectic mm -hmm. because they delivered a biological stimulus to their organism that says these type 2B fibers are unnecessary for this activity. We need to get rid of them. Well, in the long term, what you've done then is you have jettisoned one of the largest glucose reservoirs in your body and you have therefore undermined your insulin sensitivity and therefore kind of thrown gasoline on the fire of chronic inflammation and you produce a situation where you accelerate this sarcopenic disease um, expression um, rather than slow it down. That's really interesting because you set off a whole cascade of effects and right. you get yourself in the hole. Right. So a lot of us travel constantly, or, and we're in hotels and other locations that have little to no equipment, uh, certainly nothing ideal for the type of training that you're talking about. So do you have any suggestions on how these folks might gain many of the benefits that you've described when they're on the road? Yeah, the thing is that, particularly for us exercise geeks that have really gotten into resistance training or weights, is we've gotten the notion that weight weights are a necessary part of the, of the equation here, and they really aren't. Um, I can, through a protocol called infometrics um, or time static contraction, provide an intensity of workout that exceeds what I can experience with weights. Mm -hmm. You can do it in a hotel room easily. Um, it's hard to describe in a podcast, and if anyone wants to, to see some representation of it, you can just go on YouTube, put in my name, Doug McGuff, and then put in the term infometric, I-N-F-I-M-E-T-R-I-C, mm -hmm. um, and another one would be timed static contraction protocol. Um, but with no equipment, you can perform infometrics, which is basically pitting a muscle group on one side of your body against a muscle group on the other. 
So if you imagine just taking a pillowcase and holding it stretched out between your hands and doing lateral raises, pitting one deltoid muscle on the right side against the other on the left side, using a slow cadence. And in your first repetition, you're going to guesstimate a 50% effort. And then in your second repetition, you're going to guesstimate a 75% effort. And then in every repetition after that, you try to produce maximal effort, one muscle against the other, going slowly up and down um, until you can't lift either limb off your side. And you can get that accomplished usually in less than 60 seconds. And if you see the YouTube video, you'll see how that works. Um, you can do time static contraction. So if you can imagine um, just taking two foam yoga blocks between your forearms like you were doing a chest fly, squeezing your forearms together, for 30 seconds you apply 50% effort. And then at the 30 second mark, you gradually ramp that effort to 75%. And then in the last 20 to 30 seconds, you ramp that effort to 100%. The intensity of that and the depth of fatigue created by that is so astounding that it's almost mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. If you then immediately go try to do a push-up after doing that, your musculature in your chest will be so fatigued, you'll be lucky to get one, maybe two push-ups hmm. out of it. Um, but there are some videos that I've posted on YouTube that in a hotel room I could show you how to just totally get an absolutely killer workout. On days when I can't get to the gym, I do not fret about it because I know I can do something like this, and it it more than serves as a stopgap for that sort of thing. Very, Very interesting. interesting. Yeah. Blood flow restriction training, such as katsu, increases localized IGF-1 levels and sensitivity via accumulation of metabolites, particularly lactate and hydrogen ions. Do you think this type of training is useful? And if so, uh, what are the applications where it really would be of greatest benefit? Um, yeah, I think it's useful. It, it, all this research seems to have come out of Japan for some reason. Um, and, you know, Katsu has such a cool sounding name. It's no wonder everyone's grabbed a hold of it. But the idea behind the research was that by applying restriction to a limb that you're training, so if you um, look at putting a tourniquet on the upper aspect of the arm while you're doing exercise for bicep, tricep, or forearm, um, what they found is that they could get equal hypertrophy and strength adaptations using a much lighter weight. And the theory behind it was that you're concentrating uh, byproducts of metabolism that occur during um, exertion locally within the muscle. And there is some theory that uh, uh, entrapment of local IGF-1 production may be driving a lot of this. And I think it is something that is of benefit from several standpoints. One is the fact that it requires less resistance to get equal results. Um, that increases your safety margin. It also increases a margin for extremely strong people. Um, as you get much stronger, when you have to use a weight on a particular piece of equipment, it gets a lot harder to arrest the reactionary forces mm -hmm. of using that weight to stay in alignment on the machine and everything. It becomes problematic. You can literally become too strong for the mechanics of the equipment. This allows you to get around that. Um, where it becomes problematic is, you know, when you're training your trunk, there's not really a good way to do that. But there's been some research that's run in tandem with this that shows that when you use slower cadence protocol, that that creates a high degree of sustained muscular tension that produces vascular congestion within the trained musculature that traps metabolites in the same way that tourniqueting does. So these slower cadence strength training programs, I think, incorporate that aspect of a training protocol into um, the training protocol itself. So that's exploited in slower cadence training. And it doesn't have to be like you're going 10 seconds up, 10 seconds down. But if the tension's high, such that the load is continuous. I don't care if you're doing two seconds up, two seconds down. If you're expressing it in a way where the muscle's under continuous tension, that you're not resting in lockout or getting a respite, that continuous tension 
makes intramuscular pressure higher than venous partial pressure, and that therefore traps blood in the working muscle has the same effect. So it's kind yeah. of built in. Yeah, I, I, on a personal note, have had good uh, results using katsu. Mm -hmm. And I think for the reasons you mentioned, and sometimes when uh, your joints are sore and uh, it allows you to use maybe 20% of the normal oh, yeah. uh, load. And uh, also when you're on the road, it's nice, you know, right. because the hotels typically have very limited yeah. uh, selection of weights. Take you on the gym and the dumbbells end at they're, 15 they're, pounds or something. They're, like... they're blue and pink. Yeah. <laughs> So there's literature showing that electrical muscle stimulation training improves exercise tolerance and strength in healthy elderly subjects and, and also in younger populations. In particular, it's been said that it might offer promise as a way to safely hit fast twitch muscle. Have you much experience with EMS? Um, the, the answer is yes, but that experience is fairly remote. This was a big rage in the early 1980s. Um, Mike Mincer hmm. was a champion bodybuilder back in the early 1980s. He was a protege of Arthur Jones. And he became friends with a, a fellow by the name of Dr. Ziegler that kind of pioneered EMS. And he incorporated that into his training. And some people at a gym where I worked out had access to one of these. And we would actually use it not only as just a standalone, but as a mechanism of augmenting contraction at the end of the set to really push the fatigue out, you know, push how far and how deep we could inroad. Um, so I think, yes, it does have applications. It does allow you to get at those fast twitch fibers. The problem is, is you have to use it in a way, w much like with weight training, you got to get at those motor units kind of gradually and sequentially. If you just like crank up the amperage, right out of the box, you're going to create the type of muscle contraction that can rip the tendon off the bone. But where this becomes interesting is elderly patients with sarcopenia. Those type 2B, you know, those higher order motor units have been atrophied, and they've been atrophied for a long time. And this becomes um, relevant in space travel. When you're losing those motor units, if you lose them for long enough, your body starts to disconnect the innervation of those motor units. The neuromotor end plate decomposes in a way or stops functioning in a way that you no longer have the central nervous system connection to that motor unit to, to start it firing in the first place. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when we bring on elderly clients that are significantly deconditioned, what we'll find is in terms of high-intensity exertion, they just can't seem to go there, again, in air quotes, since we're on the podcast. And I think it's because they have sort of deconstructed this neuromotor connection to these higher order motor units. Where I see EMS being useful as a therapeutic modality is early on being able to activate those type 2B motor units towards the end of a set. So when they reach fatigue, that's not fatigue like a younger person that still has that connection intact. So you could invoke EMS at the end of a set to sort of wake back up those type two motor units. And once they wake back up, then we find what follows suit is the innervation of those motor units wakes up as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it can be used as a stopgap measure to rehabilitate innervation of those higher order motor units so that, um, you know, you can kind of expedite them moving along in, the, in a strengthening protocol. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. Brian Caulfield in Dublin has been doing some really interesting research on uh, EMS, both in athletic populations and also aging population, an older cohort group. And uh, I, I'm seeing uh, EMS start to swing. You know how these things wax and wane? Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it seems to be in the waxing mode right now yeah. with the advent of uh, new, less expensive units that run off smartphones. You know, so you can uh, download smartphone app and run an EMS system like PowerDot right off the phone. And uh, this affords the opportunity for all kinds of custom protocols. Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, I, I'm optimistic about the future for EMS, particularly for the populations that you, you mentioned. Right. And, um, you know, as that sort of technology becomes available, um, it, it definitely will be useful as a workaround. And it's funny when you talk about, well, there's – the athletic population, and then there's the elderly population. When you talk about high-level athletes, um, that's where you really start to realize that high-level athletes and the elderly have a lot in common. Because a lot of people conflate athleticism and health. Ugh. And they do not correlate at all. Yeah, look at boxers um, or wrestlers. Players, Athleticism yeah. and health <laughs> will track along up to a servant, certain level where you go from the hobbyist to being at the good amateur level. But as you proceed beyond that, health and athleticism start to take a divergent path. So your elderly bedridden nursing home patient in terms of their musculature and their type 2B fibers are expressing a very similar fragility as a high-level athlete does because in athletics you have physical conditioning and you have skill conditioning. And most athletes, by the very nature of their sport, have a very difficult time separating those two activities from each other. And as such, the amount of time they have to spend on their skill conditioning erodes their physical conditioning. And remember, we talked about these type 2 fibers being very powerful, but they also fatigue very quickly and they recover very slowly. So these high-level athletes have chronic fatigue in these higher-order motor units. So in a lot of ways their higher order type 2B fibers are behaving very much like your elderly bedridden patient. Except they still have a lot of them. Right. You know, they're not atrophied. That's a nice, uh, a nice description. Okay, shifting gears from resistance training methods to the closely related topic of myokines, which are cytokines secreted by working muscle. Myokines have both local actions within the muscle tissue, but also hormone-like effects that target distant organs. Can you discuss their role in both acute exercise-induced metabolic changes as well as the metabolic changes following adaptation from training? Oh, can I? <laughs> <laughs> I've become a bit of a myokine geek lately. The, the thing that was so neat when I first stumbled across this new, newly discovered field was that the whole time along, my sense of um, resistance training, of, of strength exercise, was that it was much greater than the sum of its parts. We saw levels of improvement that were way beyond what could be explained simply by the strengthening of a tissue that produced movement. And you saw it in the gym. I mean, you would go there and you would see people on the treadmill that, you know, looked like they were dying from, like they had cancer, cachexia, or AIDS. And then everyone that you wanted to look like that had the healthy glow, that act, they were in the weight room. And there was something there that explained this that we weren't quite certain. And and there were body composition improvements that were completely outside the realm of any um, caloric expenditure, energy accounting type equation. And when this finally started to come to the fore, you're like, oh, this makes perfect sense. So in a nutshell, what we're coming to find out is that skeletal muscle is not just a tissue that produces movement. Um, and that there is a reason why 
when skeletal muscle improvements happened, every other organ and system in the body seemed to track along. It seemed to follow. And when there was any deterioration in any of those body systems, it always seemed to be preceded by a loss of muscle. Well, it turns out that muscle is the biggest and most active endocrine organ in our body. And there's a whole host of myokines, probably only a handful of which have yet to be discovered, which are signaling both in a paracrine and endocrine fashion. So what that means is both signaling locally in the area where the work is being done, but also being signaled remotely to other muscle tissue and other types of tissue entirely in the body. And that means skin, hair, nervous tissue, cardiovascular t- I mean, um, the signals are going everywhere, um, and very few of them have been delineated thus far. Um, but the health benefits of them are becoming more and more obvious. Um, the, the cytokines that are released by exercising muscle have profound anti-inflammatory effects. Um, basically, they are the antithesis of the metabolic syndrome that we see being expressed in Western civilizations. They have anti-neoplastic effects um, and seem to be protect- protective and perhaps even Um, potentially uh, reversive of neoplastic changes. Um, So there's a treasure trove there waiting to be explored. It's been there all along. We knew there was something inside the black box that produced these outcomes on the other side, but now we're kind of getting some insight into exactly what they are. Yeah, I think the topic of myokines and cancer, I remember reading literature that was coming out of the laboratory of some of my colleagues back at Duke University. So Lee Jones and yeah. Allison Betoff were working on research looking at the impact of exercise on cancer. Um, and so what do we know about myokines as far as impacting cancer risk or even tumor yeah. growth or suppression? Do we, do we know any of the mechanisms right now behind how that could impact, how myokines could impact those, those things? To some extent, yes. And I, I think a lot of it is through inflammation. Uh, probably the earliest discovered myokine and the one that's probably had the most research done is interleukin-6. And interleukin-6 is normally... Um, released in very pro-inflammatory states and underpins the mechanism of a lot of cancers, a lot of neovascularization during neoplastic transformation, and is therefore presumed as a, bl- a bad player. Uh, but what, we f- what was discovered by people like you have mentioned there is that in exercise, interleukin-6 would spike in a pulse-style fashion sometimes a hundredfold. And the immediate assumption was like, ooh, that's not good. But what we found over time is that acute spike produced a marked improvement in interleukin-6 receptor sensitivity. And as the receptor sensitivity improved, circulating interleukin-6 levels over time were greatly diminished. And that greatly diminished systemic inflammation. And I think that myokine activity in terms of diminishing systemic inflammation may have a lot to do, at least on the macro level, for how this anti-neoplastic activity of myokines is. But, I mean, different myokines have been isolated, tested against breast cancer cells in vitro, and found to arrest progression of tumorigenesis Mm -hmm. in vitro for different types of cancers. And It's interesting when you look at the anti-neoplastic effects and their their mechanisms with myokines, it's similar to the sort of anti-neoplastic effects that are seen with ketogenic diet applications for treatment of cancer. And and they seem to run in similar pathways, which is very interesting to me. Yeah, that's really interesting. So how does myokine release differ with different forms of exercise? For example, aerobic versus anaerobic exercise. Yeah, and, you know, I can't tell you in specific terms like, you know, this one, interleukin-8 and interleukin-7. I would have to have the, you know, notes in front of me to tell you, but um, different myokines are invoked by different levels of intensity and duration of exercise and even particular forms of exercise. There are 
particular myokines that are invoked very aggressively with heavy eccentric or you know where you're lowering heavy weight under resistance um, or invoked by heavy, heavy negative work. There are other myokines that are invoked more by long-term steady state type exercise. Um, all of them seem to have differing effects and differing um, effects that are valuable. So that goes to say that you know there's not one specific exercise protocol that's going to invoke them all maximally in the best way possible. Um, so you know there's a whole spectrum of myokine activity across different types of exercise modalities. And I think as that gets deline delineated over time, you may be able to prescribe specific exercise modalities to orient preventing or treating certain disease states. A different approach to precision exercise or precision training. That's really interesting. Right. So how does insulin sensitivity influence the production and sensitivity of myokines? Do we know yet? Um, I don't think we know yet. I think we're starting to infer those sort of things. Um, you can see that, you know, we talked about it earlier that um, – lowering systemic inflammation seems to be a big part of their activity. But if you look at certain myokines like interleukin-15 that's released during high-intensity exertion, um, you will find that those signal for increased fatty acid utilization. They signal for increased glucose uptake into the cell and glucose utilization. And in that realm, they increase insulin sensitivity. Um, interleukin-15 by uh, as far as I know, as yet to be identified mechanism has a leptin-like effect of increasing insulin sensitivity and lowering serum insulin levels, which in terms of gross systemic inflammation is a mechanism of decreasing that and having positive health benefits. Mm -hmm. The exact biochemical pathway as to how that's occurring as far as I know, or at least certainly I don't know how those pathways go or if they're delineated or not, you know, I, I don't know that, but I do know that um, on the other end of the black box, it, it has an effect. Hmm. In a recent publication in the Journal of Biological Chemistry, the ketone metabolite acetoacetate was shown to serve as a signaling metabolite immediating muscle cell function and uh, growth. Specifically, in animal models, acetoacetate potentiated the stimulatory effect of IGF-1 on muscle cell proliferation and antagonized the inhibitory effect of myostatin. Do you see a role for endogenous or exogenous metabolites in potentially augmenting myokine-induced hypertrophy? The answer is yeah, I think so, because it's just now becoming evident that those two things seem to operate by similar mechanisms. Now, for the listener, myostatin is a particular interest to me. I kind of uh, stumbled across the research of Sejin Lee and Alexandra McFerrin out of Hopkins in the late 90s um, and became very interested in that, mostly from the get swole perspective. But um, for the listener, I mean, myostatin is a myokine that or is a chemical that acts as a negative regulator of muscle growth. So what we have to remember from a biologic perspective is that skeletal muscle is a very metabolically expensive tissue. So it has diminishing marginal utility beyond a certain point. So there's a biochemical governor that stops how big your muscles can become, and that's myostatin. Um, with sedentary lifestyles, you can develop an overexpression of myostatin that um, is part is one of the players in sarcopenia and the loss of muscle yeah, mass. Aging, you see it just yeah. as a function of age. Part um, and it's it's upregulated by the HIV virus, uh, by certain cancer cells, and is involved with uh, you know wasting cachexia, things of that nature. Um, so. The acetoacetate has been shown to blunt its effects so that you have a removal of that inhibition, so to speak, so that you allow 
or make permissive an environment that allows for muscle growth to be more friendly. Um, myokines act in a similar fashion to that, um, interleukin-15 being one of the biggies. And, you know, the, the question keeps rattling around in my head as to why is that? And my theoretical answer, and it's a theory only, is that it comes from our evolutionary background in that when, when you are going to be in ketosis is when your food supply is dwindling, that is when you're going to tend to hunt and gather. Well, in most, in an evolutionary sense, and in most hunter-gatherer civilizations, highest levels of physical output and highest intensity physical activity occurs during hunting and gathering activities. So it seems natural to me from an evolutionary standpoint that ketosis and high-level muscular activity that results in a deep level of fatigue would tend to occur and run in tandem. Therefore, in my head, I think those two things probably are running on parallel tracks, biochemically, so to speak. So it seems only logical to me to maybe exploit that evolutionary tendency um, when trying to produce a protocol that's going to result in hypertrophy. Yeah, I think it's quite wonderful that both myokines and uh, ketone bodies inhibit myostatin to some degree, right. even to a mild degree. Yeah. When pharma has spent 20 years looking for a safe, effective myostatin inhibitor, right. major effort going on. And uh, thus far, none of them are without issues. Yeah. And going back to one of your original questions about you know whether I would like to see medicine treated as, I mean, exercise treated as medicine, that's come comes full circle back around to that because whenever something like this comes up, the research all focuses on finding a pill, finding a compound, something that we can take that will invoke this when the mechanism of doing that is right in front of us. Okay. Uh, out of um, USC, there's a guy named Simon Mayloff that uh, published in PLOS One 2007 an article that basically just said strength training reverses aging in elderly subjects. Done. That was it. I'm like, huh. Yeah, so I'm always trolling PubMed and stuff like that, which is frankly torture because, um, you know, you got to kiss a lot of frogs to meet the prince Absolutely. when you're doing that. <laughs> but I met the prince on this article because, um, you know, it was way over my head. He used something called a false discovery technique to identify 300 and some odd genes that were expressed differently in youth than they were in old age. And then he was able, through this false discovery mechanism, to identify like 196 genes that were expressed differently in old age and youth. And then he took subjects and strength trained them for 12 weeks and found reversal of gene expression back to their youthful levels in 170 or 190 some odd genes. Yeah, uh, that's a complete a, reversal of aging at the molecular level in the genome. Yeah, it's a great paper. Yeah, and I, I was like, whoa, this is like seismic shift, world tip on its axis kind of, this is groundbreaking. And we're seeing things like, uh, well, we were talking about ketone bodies affecting hundreds of genes. Yeah, but Mayla's research came out, and guys, what happened? Nothing. <laughs> crickets. Those are crickets. Crickets. You guys, you guys read it. <laughs> yeah, and I was, like, blown away. I mean, our most ancient literature, Gilgamesh, it was about finding the fountain of youth, about reversing aging. They found that um, resveratrol could reverse aging in earthworms, and this stuff was flying off the shelves. Mm -hmm. This comes out and nothing happens. You know, and we're talking about potentially in the future, you know, stem cell research, um, CRISPR-Cas2 mm -hmm. manipulations, prolonging lifespan, and it's like, I'm 54 years old. To me, what this says is the stopgap until we get there is strength training. 
Yeah, they'll be using CRISPR to uh, knock out some myostatin, and uh, yeah. that'll, that'll be the new doping. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and somebody will be making a lot of money off of that. <laughs> so you've talked a little bit about ketone uh, bodies. So what are your thoughts on nutrition, and to what extent do you see nutrition playing a role in skeletal muscle adaptation to exercise? Um, nutrition for me is a little bit delicate because I'm not one of the hardcore nutrition geeks. I'm more on the exercise side, but I have a huge interest in nutrition. Um, I'm kind of in the paleo camp. And the reason for it is my clients always got stronger, but a lot of times they did not achieve the aesthetic goals that they had for themselves. Mm -hmm. And until we started handing them Mark Sisson's Primal Prescription, Rob Wolf's Paleo Solution, um, The One Diet by Simon Chawcross, the books that focused on a paleo or an evolutionary-based diet. Mm -hmm. Until we, you know, we tried all sorts of things, but once we started handing those books out to our clients, the results were, in terms of aesthetics and body composition improvement, were way better than we'd ever seen. And what became very evident to me is that you can never exercise your way out of a bad diet, period. Yeah. Um, and I think that because of that, it is an essential and necessary permissive component to having any sort of results. For me, diet is a very simple heuristic that I like to follow. And I like to think of diet as a straight line between the sun and the human body. So you can get out in the sun, you convert vitamin D, probably a host of other nutrients we don't even know about that just directly act upon us. Or the sun acts on plants that photosynthesize. We eat those plants. We eat the animals that ate those plants. We eat the animals that eat the animals that eat the plants. And as long as you stay on that straight line, you're good. When you start deviating off that line into things that are synthesized and industrialized food, um, the human health crisis in America probably has a lot more to do with the federal government mandating that ethanol be 10% of our gasoline supply mm -hmm. than anything. Because that economic signal disruption has driven and distorted our agriculture so grossly that now we have this huge refined carbohydrate problem, omega-6, omega-3 imbalance, all these signal disruptions that have occurred simply by going off of that straight line. And that's how I think of nutrition. I was looking just recently uh, for a, a, nothing related to STEM talk, but I was looking with a friend at uh, photographs of his life, and there were pictures from World War II, and right before the war, during the war, and after the war, and there were pictures of families and a classroom of kids, Yeah, all very lean. Yeah. And what a what a complete transformation! Yeah, and it's particularly evident here in the states, and I think it's because there's so much processing. We, the grains that we do eat, we refine them, we strip the nutrients out, and then we add them back in through fortification. I think a fortification process mm -hmm. creates a signal disruption mm -hmm. that undermines the act of leptin and appetite control. You know, I gave a lecture in Dresden, Germany, this time last year. And it was given in uh, a, mu a museum hall um, for physical culture over there. And there was a group of school children touring through there while I was there. And I took a cell phone picture of these kids. And I texted it to my wife. And I'm like, look at this. This is an elementary school class in Germany. And I didn't tell her anything else. I just texted her the picture. She texted back. She goes, not one fat kid. Yeah, it's and, a huge I mean, it, change. It's amazing. Just uh, little things like that make a huge difference, and it's signal disruption that's doing it. You know? The rest of the world is catching up. You yeah, know, they I've, are with a vengeance and I've fast. Sp I've been spending time in uh, the UAE, and, uh, boy, it's, they have a big problem, Yeah, a growing problem. Yeah, and the sad thing is is the later you get – introduce in an evolutionary sense the the further along you go without these signal disruptions when they finally do get introduced to you 
they are much more disruptive than if you come from a gene line that's had a, a century to adapt to it. That's why, you know, you see Pima Indians getting morbidly obese, um, you know, or, or the American Eskimos when they get exposed to a Western diet just blow up. I just don't know how to handle it. Right, because they, they don't have the, the even a hundred years makes a difference in your ability to adapt to that, to that kind of disruption, you know. Yeah. So stepping away from nutrition and, and diet, um, what's your opinion on engaging optimal planes of movement during an exercise session in regards to mobility and neural, neural stimulation? Well, optimal planes of movement define differently for neuromotor systems and your nervous system and the representation of proprioception in your central nervous system. Those define differently than they do when you're conducting a strengthening protocol. Mm -hmm. When you're conducting a strengthening protocol, you have to load with resistance in a plane that is safe, um, that follows muscle and joint function in a way that's not gonna put you in vulnerable joint positions. So there are joint positions that from a um, neuromotor and coordination proprioceptive standpoint, um, are very important and necessary. But I would not ever put a subject under load in one of those positions. For instance, a very, you know, arm overhead behind your back, like you see with uh, an Olympic lift or a snatch or something like that, not a fan of because you're well out of scapulohumeral timing. Mm -hmm. You've closed the gap between the rotator cuff and the roof of the acromion bone over the shoulder joint, so you're scrubbing all those tendons through there when you're doing that. So you cannot conflate um, important movement patterns with important movement patterns when exercising under load or you're going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. So I think the more important thing is to engage the musculature under meaningful load that causes continuous exposure and deep fatigue, but do it in a way that's joint neutral and is not going to injure you. Once you've done that, the musculature has been strengthened throughout its full range of motion. The musculature is, you know, the, the motor units that you're training are spread throughout the muscle in a homogeneous fashion. They're everywhere. Um, one motor unit may represent 100 fibers, but one of those fibers may be in the left upper quadrant of your bicep and the other in the right lower quadrant of your bicep. So they're distributed homogeneously. So the fact that you weren't in a particular joint position when you strengthen the muscle doesn't mean that it's not going to be functional in that joint position when you need to use it. So train with safety in mind, and then once you become stronger, that strength can be manifest in all the meaningful positions that are appropriate for CNS proprioception. But don't conflate the two because if you do, you're likely to get hurt. Shut yourself up for injury. Yeah, correct, that makes correct. Sense. So, Doug, we already mentioned uh, the book Body by Science that you co-authored with John Little. It's an excellent yeah, book. Thanks. You also have a newer book sporting the rather uh, depressing but informative <laughs> title, The Primal Prescription, Surviving the Sick Care Sinkhole. Can you tell us a little bit more about that book? Yeah, that um, – Mark Sisson actually approached me asking me to come in on that project. And I was reluctant to do so because I knew it would be painful. So as a backdrop, I'm an emergency physician. Um, and emergency medicine since 1986 has been under a federal law called EMTALA. And EMTALA stands for Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. And it was a little tag-on to an omnibus reconciliation bill that occurred in 1986. And basically what it said is that emergency departments must see and provide stabilizing treatment to everyone that presents, regardless of ability mm -hmm. to pay. And that turns out to be regardless of intention to pay. <laughs> <clears throat> so the ERs across the country became the de facto safety net for a failing medical care system. And in medicine, there's always been people that were sick, old, and poor. And they always represented a moral hazard to the system because they're so costly to take care of. So 
the medical system has always tried to sweep them under some rug that's going to take care of them. Mm-hmm. Prior to 1986, there was something that the government did called the Hill-Burton Act. And what the Hill-Burton Act did was it provided funding to rural hospitals, teaching hospitals, um, <clears throat> and county charity hospitals in exchange for this is where the indigent go. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> But that law had a tenure to it that lasted approximately 40 years. So Imtala was advertised as a law that came to be because, you know, um, private hospitals were dumping indigent patients onto the university hospitals. But it kind of ignored the fact that that was the deal. You got federal funding in exchange for, yeah, you're the place that takes care of indigent people. But eventually, that load reached critical mass where even they were starting to scream. And the Hill-Burton Law was running out by 1986. Most places that were chartered under Hill-Burton with a 40-year tenure, those crows were coming to roost in 1986. It was over. So, you know, that Senator Kim was actually heard on the floor say, we need a crisis. Mm-hmm. And that crisis became this patient dumping crisis. Uh, news stories were done on 60 Minutes at a University of Chicago and Parkland and Dallas. And then that was a justification for Imtala. Mm-hmm. And we've been under that ever since. So that's given me a front row seat to the decay and collapse of our medical system in this country and how it happened and, and uh, the whole process of it and how – you know, recent attempts to address it through the Affordable Care Act have just taken it and um, put it on steroids and created a rationing through a back door and made the medical system almost impossible to navigate. Mm-hmm. So the book, part of the book was to show how we got where we are. Number two was the book was right, written right as the Affordable Care Act was coming into play. So the middle third of the book is, and this is what's coming. And the final one third of the book is, okay, the real answer to this is to apply medicine as it should be, as we discussed at the beginning of this talk, as prevention, and stay out of the belly of the beast. So part of the final one third of the book is focused on how to not get sucked into this horrible system. But if you do, here's a way to navigate it and come out alive. Mm. That's the book in a nutshell. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I've got it on my uh, a, a desk. It's a hard read. It was even harder. I mean, for me, it was done in the midst of working full-time emergency medicine, rotating. So it was literally written a paragraph at a time. Fortunately, they paired me up with Bob Murphy, who is a brilliant economist and really contributed massively um, to it um, in a way that saved the book. Um, but researching it and writing it was the hardest 18, you know, hardest year of my life because it was like watching sausage being made on an epic scale. I mean, it was just it's yeah. way worse than you would ever imagine and way shadier than has ever been advertised. I mean, no, it's amazing. I have no problem uh, imagining. Yeah. Well, Doug, this has been a lot of fun, and we will put links to your lecture at IHMC that you're doing this evening in the show notes, as well as pointers to your blog and to your books. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. It's been my privilege, and it's been a blast. Thanks so much. did a great job, and uh, tonight I'm sure we'll be packed. You know, there'll be two or three hundred people all just uh, eager to hear your talk. All right. (laughs) I'm going to go throw up. (laughs) (laughs) No, thank you for coming. No, it'll be great. I'm looking forward to it. STEM talk. 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 That was such a fun interview with Doug McGuff. His approach makes sense when it comes to overall health and fitness. It was great to hear him explain the science behind super slow, high intensity, short duration exercise too. Yes, it is controversial in some quarters and quite a departure from the typical fitness regimes one sees on display in gyms around the country. His approach is particularly interesting in the context of the aging population in my view. Yeah, absolutely, certainly interesting stuff. If you enjoy this interview as much as we did, I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes. 
This is Don Cornegas signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.